invite you to turn your Bibles to Acts chapter 7. We've been um, looking at this uh, sermon from Stephen for the last couple of weeks. I want to read the text. We're going to pick it up right in the middle of what he was saying, starting in verse 17. Acts chapter 7, beginning at verse 17. But at, as the time of the um, promise, this thing's moving here. I'm not sure why. But, but, but at the time of the promise drew near, which... God had granted to Abraham, the people increased and multiplied in Egypt until there arose over Egypt another king who did not know Joseph. He, dw he dwelt shrewdly with our race and forced our fathers to expose their infants so that they would not be kept alive. At this time, Moses was born, and he was beautiful in God's sight, and he was brought up for three months in his father's house, and when he was exposed... Pharaoh's daughter adopted him and brought him up as her own son. And Moses was instructed in all the wisdom of the Egyptians, and he was mighty in his words and deeds. When he was 40 years old, it came into his heart to visit his brothers, the children of Israel, um, I'm sorry, his brothers, um, the children of Israel, and seeing one of them being wronged, he defended the oppressed man and avenged him by striking down the Egyptian. He supposed that his brothers would understand that God was giving them salvation by his hand, but they did not understand. And on the following day, he appeared to them as they were quarreling and tried to reconcile them, saying, Men, you are brothers. Why do you wrong each other? But the man who was wronging his neighbor thrust him aside, saying, Who made you a ruler and a judge over us? Do you want to kill me as you killed the Egyptian yesterday? At this retort, Moses fled and became an exile in the land of Midian, where he became the father of two sons. Over the past couple of weeks, we've considered Stephen's sermon. I was asking this question, when our Christianity is challenged, what do we say? How do we respond? I believe that Stephen's sermon provides a framework of how we should speak when we are called upon to give a defense for our faith. And so I'm trying to build a case now in terms of how we are to respond. My suggestion at the beginning was from, from what Stephen is saying in his sermon, obviously he's starting from the Old Testament um, history of the Jews. And, and I think we need to begin with God, realizing that God has a plan in all that happens. Surely we have to start there. I think our temptation sometimes when we are challenged about what we believe, we start in all different directions instead of really starting with God in the scripture. But Stephen starts there and he begins to show that God had a plan in all of this. Our defense must also include a statement of how God works everything out according to his purpose. He works out his plan by his providence, by his invisible hand, if you will. God did that uh, did not merely wind up the world and watch it run, but he continues to be active in his created world, bringing everything toward its intended will and purpose. Stephen actually illustrated the plan of God using Abraham, and then he illustrated God's providence using the life of Joseph. And today we're going to see that he's going to use the life of Moses to illustrate, among other things, God's promises. When trying to make a case for the defense of Christ and Christianity, it's important for us not to leave out the promises of God. It's hard to deny that God makes and keeps promises. Admitting that God has made promises and that he has kept them demands that we do something in response to the promises of God. To admit that God makes and keeps promises actually establishes the truth that God can be trusted. Now think about it, if God makes a promise and we look in the past and we see how he's kept his promises, that tells us we can trust him. So we're building this case when people ask you, what is the foundation for your faith? Why do you believe that stuff? We start with God, we start with his plan, we start with watching as God has worked through his plan, providence, and now we're looking at his promises, how he has made promises in the past and always kept them, and so he can be trusted. Any promise that he has made that is yet to be fulfilled, surely that promise will be fulfilled. As Stephen made the religious leaders face and acknowledge God's promises made to Moses, they were forced to face the, the promises that God had made to the people of Israel regarding a future deliverer. 
So as he begins to paint the picture of Moses, they have to come face to face with the idea that God had in fact sent later another deliverer, namely Jesus, and they had missed that. And so he's going to take the story of Moses and weave that through to the point where it's going to point to them and say to them, in effect, just like the people of Israel failed to follow Moses as their deliverer, so you have failed to understand who Jesus was as a deliverer. That's where we're going. So as we read ahead, we know that Jesus was the fulfillment of God's promise as a deliverer, as the redeemer, as the Messiah. But they had refused to accept him, and they had, in fact, killed him. And so now they're kind of come face to face with Stephen, again, making his case here that you rejected Jesus, you killed Jesus, you are responsible for that. Now what are you going to do about it? Now they responded like maybe people respond to you when you give a defense for your faith. It may not go well for you initially. But nevertheless, Stephen honored God by making the case, and then not a bad thing, that very day, Stephen was in the presence of God. We'll get to that in a few weeks, but right now I want to show you something, that God makes promises. The promises he makes, we can be certain they will come true if they have not come true already. Now, God had made a promise about enslavement in Egypt. Again, the people he's talking to, they understood their own history. As Stephen begins his defense, he started with Abraham. And Genesis chapter 15 holds the record of God's promise. And in that promise to Abraham, remember we looked at that the first week, that there was going to be a 400-year enslavement of the people of Israel in the land of Egypt. That was promised by God. These people to whom Stephen is preaching understand that. They know their own history. Those who were listening to Stephen knew that. For four centuries, the Israelites knew the tyranny of the pharaohs and the bitterness of slavery. Not long after moving to Egypt, after, after other, and other pharaohs began to rise to power, remember the scripture says, there, there arose a pharaoh who didn't know Joseph. And so they had this 400 years as they continued to gain in strength, lots of kids born and the, the population began to grow. The, the, the Egyptians began to, to have a concern about that. These people may take over, so they enslaved them. The people in utter despair cried out in, in the dark silence, but nothing happened for 400 years, just like God had promised. But he would hear and he would respond at the promised time. Listen to this in Exodus chapter 2. Verses 23 through 25. The people of Israel groaned because of their slavery and cried out for help. Their cry for rescue from slavery came up to God. And God heard their groaning and God remembered his covenant with Abraham and with Isaac and with Jacob. And God saw the people of Israel and God knew. Now that's a strange statement. What did God know? Well, God knew their suffering. God also knew his plan. God also knew the time. The silence was about to end. This was, not only the on, this was not the only time in history when God appeared to be silent. Let me remind you, at the end of the Old Testament, you, have your, you people know your Bibles. What's the last book in the Old Testament? Malachi. Or somebody said, Malachi. No, it's Malachi. <clears throat> okay, so Malachi um, writes, he lays down his pen, roughly around 400, maybe a little bit earlier than that. And he lays down his pen, and for 400 years, there's silence. God doesn't speak. And then finally, after that 400 years, a prophet comes along and he begins to pre prepare the way for Messiah. And that prophet was John the Baptist. And then who appears but the Lord Jesus? Hmm, 400 years, silence, and then 
comes the deliverer. 400 years silence in Egypt, and then comes the deliverer. 400 years silence in Israel, and then comes the deliverer. Interesting. Malachi wrote, Behold, I send my messenger, and he will prepare the way before me. And the Lord whom you seek will suddenly come into his temple. Just as the Israelites were enslaved in Egypt, hearing nothing from God, believing God to have abandoned them, so the Jews before Stephen were wondering the same thing. But he had promised a deliverer for the Israelites in Egypt, and he had also promised a deliverer to the Jews to whom Stephen was preaching. And that promise of a deliverer Again, it went something like this. God told Abraham that after 400 years, the people of God would be brought back into the land and someone would be sent to deliver them. Near the end of the 400 years, God sent a deliverer both times. You have to marvel at this statement from Malachi. And the Lord whom you seek will suddenly come into his temple. You read the gospel accounts, Jesus walks right into the temple, deliberately declaring his authority. But the Jews failed to recognize him. And when he helped them see who he really was, just like Moses did initially, they rejected their deliverer. God makes promises. Regardless of the responses, please do not forget that God keeps his promises. The fulfillment of God's promise of blessing comes. God allowed the Israelites to multiply. He blessed them even though they were in bondage. Even when the Pharaoh had determined to kill the, all the male babies, the midwives courageously disobeyed the king. You remember the story. In fact, quoting from Exodus, God dealt well with the midwives, and the people multiplied and grew very strong. And because the midwives feared God, he gave them family. And one of those male babies born was a big part of the blessing of God. In fact, he was the fulfillment of God, of God's promise for a deliverer. I want you to see something here. First, I want to speak about Moses. And then I want to um, draw that to help you see something about Jesus. Let's start with protection from death. For three months, the baby was hidden from the authorities. When Moses was first born, all the babies are to be killed. Moses is protected. When that was no longer possible, the baby was placed in a, in a basket and allowed to float on the Nile River near the shore. Though all the time, being carefully watched by big sister Miriam. It's hard for a woman to resist a baby. And the Pharaoh's daughter was no exception. She sees this basket. She sends a servant over to pick up the basket, bring it back. She opens up the basket, and there's little baby Moses crying. Oh. <laughs> she sees the baby. She's enamored by this beautiful little infant. And in a wonderful demonstration of God's providence, she hires at the encouragement of Miriam, she hires an Israelite to care for the child who turns out to be Moses' birth mother. Now, how about that? You have a baby, you have to give the baby up, sort of, but then you get the baby back and they pay you for it. That's not bad. <laughs> That's the providence of God at work. God had promised to send a deliverer and he kept, he, he kept him from death until he would lead his people out of bondage. Not only did God give the blessing of life, but he also provided an education. Moses was taught well so that he excelled, the scripture says, in words and deeds. He knew how to do things well and he knew how to say things well. All of this would be needed with his encounters with the Pharaoh later on in life. The promise of God was kept alive and strengthened. Moses also developed a passion for justice. Surely Moses' mother had taught him much about his Hebrew heritage. He was considered an Egyptian, 
but he had compassion on the people of his own heritage. He protected his Hebrew brother by killing the Egyptian. This is really quite an interesting account in the book of Exodus. One day when Moses had grown up, he went out to his people and looked on their burdens and he saw an Egyptian beating a Hebrew, one of his people. He looked this way and that and seeing no one, he struck down the Egyptian and hit him in the sand. You can see that happening. He also sought to help his Hebrew brothers get along by breaking up a fight between them a task that, by the way, he would have to repeat thousands of times later on in his life. <laughs> Whatever else we can say, he had a passion for justice. He also was being prepared for ministry. You know the story. The people rejected his early attempts, and he was forced to flee to a Midian desert. Can you imagine 40 years on the backside of the desert, the only intelligible word he heard all day long was, bah, ah, ah, ah. 40 years. But through that experience, he learned some valuable lessons about walking by faith. It would be 40 years before he would come again to his people. Those listening to Stephen knew all about that. And they believed all of that. They highly re revered Moses, but they failed to make the connection to Jesus. Think about it. Jesus was protected from death at birth, remember? Remember? The ruler was different. It was Herod, not Pharaoh, but the intent was the same. But God, using earthly parents, protected the chosen deliverer traveling to Egypt until the threat had passed. Jesus spent his childhood years in Nazareth, growing in wisdom and stature, says the scripture, in favor with God and man. In other words, he grew intellectually, physically, spiritually, and socially. Throughout those first 30 years of life, he was in seclusion, being prepared for public ministry as a great deliverer of his people. The Jews initially rejected Moses. It would be years later when he would return and finally be accepted as their leader. Jesus would also be rejected, and, then, and, and they would kill him. The parallels are just too close to miss. As Stephen continues to bring his listeners along to a place where they must intersect with the truth of who Jesus is. Here's the issue. When the truth is presented to the point where it cannot be ignored, then there will be a response. Often, people will attempt to alter God's promises. That's what takes place in this text. How do, how do people alter the promises of God? Well, one thing they do is devalue the promise. The Jews had been crying out for a deliverer. God heard them and he sent Moses, but they did not accept him as deliverer. Not acceptable. This cannot be the prophesied one. Send somebody else. Stephen says of Moses, he supposed that his brothers would understand that God was giving them salvation by his hand, but they did not understand. You see any connection there with Jesus? I'm reminded of John's word and John's words in the gospel that bears his name. He was in the world, yet the world did not know him. He came to his own, and his own people did not receive him. The promised Messiah had come. Salvation would come through his hand, but they trashed the promise and rejected the deliverer. They devalued the promise of God. They failed to see the worth of the promise. But it gets worse. They sought to destroy the promise. Moses broke up this fight and he tried to preach a message of peace, but they wouldn't have it. They knew what he had done to the Egyptian. Now, when this was happening, remember that when the Egyptian was attacking the Hebrew, Moses comes along and he kills the Egyptian, puts him in the sand, but the Hebrew was okay, and he goes back, and he tells the story of what took place. There had been a witness. That meant that Moses, now that the word was out, would not be safe, and so he was forced to flee. In effect, the deliverer had been eliminated and was gone. I don't need to say much about the parallel concerning the Lord Jesus. The people rejected him as well. And in his case, he did not flee, but endured the rage and paid the ultimate price. 
you see what Stephen's doing here? He's taking history, history that they were very familiar with, and he's showing them that the history is pointing to Jesus. Now, we know that's true because we, we've spent some time in Luke 24. Remember that passage with, with the two who were going back to Emmaus after the, the Jesus' resurrection from the dead? And they meet Jesus along the way, but they don't, they don't realize it's, it's Jesus. And he takes the Old Testament scriptures and he shows them the Christ. He shows them that Jesus had to die and be raised from the dead. We don't know the passages he looked at. But Stephen takes that same basic idea and he begins to show from Old Testament history what was going to happen, what, what happened back then that they would affirm and how that also pointed to what was going to happen to Jesus and affirmed that as well. He takes the history of his people and shows them how God was orchestrating everything, good and bad, to ultimately work out his plan of deliverance. But they failed to see that and they fail to see it now. Many people fail to see it now. But it's hard to destroy a promise even if the promise maker is eliminated. So further action was taken by people to not only do those things to the promise, but also to discredit and disqualify the promise. Basically, this one is unable to deliver, they're saying. Not only did the Israelites fail to understand who Moses was, they rejected the very promise of God. God would not deliver his people with somebody like you, they're saying. Who made you ruler and judge over us, is their exact words. Isn't it amazing that we plead to God to help, and when he sends help, we reject it? And then we tell God exactly the way we want him to help us. People did not want to be delivered in the way in which God planned. That, that was true of the Israelites in Egypt, and that was true for the Jews in Jerusalem listening to Stephen's sermon. We want a savior of our own making. We want a God who we can control. We want salvation on our terms. We want to design our own savior. It was true for Moses. It was true for Jesus. It still is. So, when our Christianity is challenged, what do we say? How do we respond? We start with God. He's the one true God, and he's the all-powerful God, and he has a plan, and he's working out that plan. Providentially, he makes everything work just in the right way at just the right time according to his perfect plan. That has been true throughout history. Do we have any idea what the plan is? Matter of fact, we have some idea. He has made many promises regarding deliverance. He promised his people in various ways throughout history, and all of his promises have a common thread. They're all tied to Jesus. Listen to this from the writer of the Hebrews. Long ago, at many times and in many ways, God spoke to our fathers by the prophets. But in these last days, he has spoken to us by his Son whom he appointed the heir of all things, through whom also he created the world. He is the radiance of the glory of God and the exact imprint of his nature, and he upholds the universe by the word of his power. After making purification for sin, he sat down at the right hand of the majesty on high. God promised to deliver us from bondage, the bondage of sin, the inability to be right with God, God promised to deliver us from that. He promised to deliver us from the penalty of sin, death, both physical and spiritual. He promised to deliver us from the grave. And when he comes to raise our bodies to be like his glorious body, he will have fulfilled the, that promise. Some were asking and some still ask, where's the promise of his coming? Many have asked that question throughout the ages. The answer remains the same. He will answer. We keep waiting and keep watching. He can be trusted so we can keep trusting. He will fulfill all of his promises in his own time for his own glory, for the good of those who love him. So I want to close with what Peter had to say about this. Scoffers will come in the last days with scoffing, 
following their own sinful desires, they will say, where is the promise of his coming? I thought he promised that. Where's the promise of that? Where, where is the answer to that promise? Or they deliberately overlooked this fact that the heavens existed long ago and the earth was formed out of water and through water by the word of God. And that by means of these, the world that then existed was deluged with water and perished. But by the same word, the heavens and the earth that now exist are stored up for fire, being kept until the day of judgment and destruction of the ungodly. But do not overlook this one fact, beloved, that with the Lord one day is as a thousand years, a thousand years is one day. The Lord is not slow to fulfill his promise, as some count slowness, but is patient toward you, not willing that any should perish, but that all should reach repentance. But the day of the Lord will come like a thief, and then the heavens will pass away with a roar, and the heavenly bodies will be burned up and dissolved, and the earth and the works that are done on it will be exposed. We can make a case for the promises of God. Can we not? He kept his promises in the past. He will keep his promises yet to be fulfilled. If he kept these back here, surely we can understand he's going to keep those that are yet to come. And so we make our case. But we also have a responsibility in how we are to live in light of our promises. Peter says this, that we are to live lives of holiness and godliness. Isn't it interesting that as believers, sometimes we try to make a case for God and redemption and salvation and changing us and cleansing us, but we're not walking according to his will or his way? What kind of testimony is that? It says one thing, but it looks like something else. So Peter writes, we're to live lives of holiness and godliness, waiting for and hastening the coming of the day of God. According to his promise, we are waiting for new heavens and a new earth in which righteousness dwells. Therefore, beloved, since you are waiting for these, be diligent to be found by him without spot or blemish and at peace. And count the patience of our Lord as salvation. Take care that you are not carried away with the error of lawless people and lose your own stability, but grow in grace and knowledge of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. To him be glory both now and to the day of eternity. Amen. So, will those to whom we must give a defense for the faith that we have, will they listen? Maybe. Maybe not. Will they believe? Maybe. Maybe not. What matters most is that we honor God by faithfully declaring his truth. God is the heart changer. Our responsibility is to testify of the God of our salvation. That will fulfill our assignment as we make him known, and that will bring glory to him. And if we are, if, if we are um, persecuted for our faith, so be it. God is glorified. If they believe as a result of our testimony to his truth, glory to God. Either way, he's glorified. And that's my assignment, and that's your assignment. To bring him glory. This past week, I had a, a funeral, someone I did not know, and um, it was hard because I, I was pretty certain, having talked with family members, that there was little, if any, understanding of the Word of God. Little, if any, understanding of Jesus as Savior. So what am I supposed to say? And essentially, it was not from this text, but the same kind of idea. Let me tell you about God. Let me tell you about God's plan. Let me tell you about God's providence. Let me tell you about God's promises. For those who belong to him, the promises are wonderful. 
But God has also made some promises to those who do not belong to him. And those are difficult to handle, but promises nonetheless. God keeps those good promises, but he also keeps those other promises. And we better be ready to meet him. What will you say if you're asked to defend your faith? You start with God. You talk about his plan and his providence. You share his promises. And you call them to Jesus. Let's pray. Father, thank you for giving us some time to think about this, to realize that in the end, your word is about your son. It all eventually points to Jesus, your son, our savior, the one who paid the price that we might have eternal life. We thank you for that great gift of the gospel of Christ. We thank you for the privilege of being able to know you. And, and when we think about all the promises that you gave for a deliverer to come, and then we realize that the deliverer has come. He is the Messiah. He is the one who came. He is the one who bore our sin. He is the one who paid for all of our sin. We thank you for that wonderful promise that's been fulfilled for those of us who belong to you. For those who do not, perhaps some in this room, they've not understood the promise. They've not understood the Savior. They've not understood the great Deliverer. They have not bowed before you, confessing their sin and believing in Jesus. We'd ask that you would open their hearts to believe. For the rest of us, may we look more carefully in the, in the time we have left in the Word of God so that we answer well, but we also live well, so that when we stand before you, we can we can be assured that we gave our all to glorify your holy name. Thank you for allowing us to stand on the promises, to know the truth of the word of God. And you've given us the privilege to live the word of God as you help us by the spirit of God. Grant your grace, even as you work in our hearts, even now, in Jesus' name.